Senator Mitchell, welcome back to the committee. Thank you. Um, I have thought we were about to close, but I think <coughs> Senator Stone has some questions. Thank you, Madam uh, Chairwoman and uh, S Senator Mitchell. Um, I want to just I want to commend you um, on your goals of this legislation, which is not to vilify and criminalize uh, women or boys or girls that, against their will, uh, are being exploited, coerced uh, into the, the sex trade business, which, mm -hmm. by the way, is a uh, a thriving business in Riverside County that we're, yes, we're certainly is. trying to address. Um, I do have a question for um, our district attorney um, coalition here today. Which one? There are several um, individual counties represented plus the district attorney Sacramento or LA uh, or the association. Anyone? San Diego and Sacramento are yeah. here and the association. Good. And Alameda County as well. So we have a bunch yeah. of lawyers and I will profess I'm not a lawyer. But as I read this legislation, I want to uh, understand the way I interpret it is this bill exempts both the buyer and the seller of sex if you will um, in people less than 18 years old so can we clarify that in other words if we have a 17 year old uh, high school boy that uh, decides he wants to go engage in uh, um, a, uh, getting uh, a prostitute uh, is he able to go and get a less than 18-year-old prostitute and not be um, um, criminally charged for that? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Correct. So, and that's where um, I'm can concerned. Can I add something to that, please? Yes. Because it goes back to what yeah. Senator Anderson said as well. Now, and I think his question may have been a little different. I don't want to speak for <coughs> him by any means. But in the case of the minor pimp, which was his question. Mm -hmm. I understand your question is a little different, but I want to yes. clarify. So yes, the answer, if, 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 if it's a minor who's soliciting, they are covered under 1322. Okay. If the minor is engaged in pimping and pandering, he would not be, and he would still be charged under the penal code. I appreciate you making that uh, distinction, and that's... And I'll give you the code section. That's the, the problem that I have with this because by uh, allowing one to pursue um, prostitution services, if you will, an underage boy or <coughs> an underage girl, probably in a very uh, minority of, of cases, um, this is where I think we come up with the de facto uh, legalization of juvenile prostitution. Um, I, I think your bill has got great intent and I hope that uh, we can work together to, to make it stronger because um, I, think, I think you're almost there. Um, I, I personally would like to see uh, some type of an amendment that could potentially read, uh, the provision shall not apply to a victim of pimping, pandering, human trafficking, or sexual exploitation, um, and somehow make it clear that those seeking those services, if they're less than 18 years old, are gonna get prosecuted. Uh, another concern I have is um, with these homes, and according to the Welfare Institutions Code, uh, the district attorneys made it clear that, uh, I believe it was you, that uh, said that there are some homes that may not accept these kids. And so what guarantees do we have that these kids are going to be put in a safe haven, if you will? Um, I can tell you, there's, I, I know of instances in Riverside County in one particular case where a, uh, a pimp had a, a child prostitute right in their own blood that they were dedicated to that pimp and uh, obviously the pimp controlled their their, their uh, controlled substance abuse um, and so there's a there's this tremendous bond between the uh, the victim and those that are controlling the victim and uh, at least in uh, juvenile hall while I, while I agree that we shouldn't be prosecuting these kids against their will that are in this business at least they're in a protected environment and hopefully seeking the services. And I think it was the district attorney of Sacramento. Uh, I was very impressed uh, with your program that you have here, uh, where you've got the courts involved, social services involved, uh, evaluation of their risks, uh, substance abuse issues. Uh, that is a holistic approach that we need to somehow emphasize and if we can, um, put into to code. But I think without amending this bill 
in a way that just protects um, the victim, mm -hmm. um, I think we're sending a wrong message to um, young boys and girls um, that prostitution is is allowed. And, and, it's, and I know I know Senator Mitchell, you're not here to advocating prostitution be allowed. Nor do I believe this bill does that. Yeah, so but, we may have to agree to disagree. So. Right. So those those are my concerns. And if uh, if you're if you're open to some amendments to ensure that it's just narrowly focused to the, the victim. Um, I would be happy to uh, join in the effort in protecting these these victims of these horrific uh, horrific crimes, and that they're going to bear these scars for for many many years. Are going to need a lot of social services and a lot of help to get them back on track. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Would you like to close? Thank you very much. I would be happy to because um, there's. There's a lot going on. And, and as I said earlier, you know, Mary Wright Edelman, the founder of the Children's Defense Fund, I think says it brilliantly that the number one challenge children experience are adults most days. And that became evident to me today once again. Uh, let me get to, let, let me just make a global statement if I can. Um, the whole concept, concept of sexually exploited children and children being sold into the sex slave trade is a concept that doesn't fit neatly into our minds or our experiences or any government system. It just doesn't. It doesn't fit neatly into the juvenile justice system. It doesn't fit neatly um, and holistically in the child welfare system. And so this is a classic example of government being caught behind the eight ball, if you will, where a public phenomenon happen and now we're trying to figure out our response. Uh, there's no joke that, you know, if you go to a surgeon, he's going to recommend surgery. In this case, the DAs are going to re recommend status quo in terms of the view they have of the world. Child welfare services are going to recommend the, the view, their view of the world. And this population of victimized child is a relatively new phenomenon that government has got to figure out what we do to protect them, because that's fundamentally our job. Just as many people have questioned whether child welfare services are equipped, I appreciate the work of the DAs who are represented here today and their visionary work. No one has asked the question of every DA in every county has equivalent supportive services to meet the needs of these children. Nobody has asked that question. What the legislature has stated very clearly in legislation and a budget act is that we are setting a new policy direction in our core belief about where children who are victims are best served. This bill is, is merely one step, albeit a significant one, in that new, that policy shift in that new way of thinking. I appreciate the DAs have a vested interest um, in their programs. I appreciate the Sacramento DA inviting me to consult with the Sacramento DA to work on this issue. Um, I got no letter of opposition from Sacramento, so if they want to engage, they should engage in the rules of engagement and communicate with my office. I appreciate having heard from the San Diego, Alameda, and the District Attorney's Association in writing. I appreciate getting their thoughts in writing ahead of time. That's very helpful. Let me respond to some of the specific issues that were raised. With regard to mandated reporting, uh, Penal Code 11666 requires that a cross-report to law enforcement, including the DA, has been required for years by mandatory reporting and is, and is reinforced by Senate Bill 794. One of the district attorneys suggested that if we decriminalize um, uh, prostitution for youths, that they wouldn't get the cross, that they wouldn't get the report to law enforcement, and we're saying that that is not the case. Again, with regard to how many counties are really uh, uh, being uh, engaged in CSEC, we want to clarify, and there was another statement that they weren't required to opt in until 2017. To date, as of 2015, actually, 35 counties have indeed opted in. And those 35 counties geographically cover most of the state. Several additional counties have expressed interest in, in the option this upcoming year, so that 35 number could grow. And in multiple counties, um, 
the uh, law center um, have worked collaboratively with the DAs and are at the table in helping to develop the CSEC interagency protocol. So there was a question about everyone needs to be at the table, all vested interests. And in there's no prohibition from the DAs being at the table in developing those interagency protocols. In many counties, that is actually happen happening. Again, to answer Senator Anderson's question with regard to pimping and pandering, those who are underage uh, who engage in those criminal acts will not be impacted by the language in SB 1322. In my own county of Los Angeles, the LA uh, First Responder Protocol currently does have law enforcement identifying children and reporting to child welfare services, which triggers a response by child welfare and an advocate. And so again, that's another example where the collaboration is working very well. Given the nature of these crimes, the newness of this phenomenon in the eyes of government and historic government structures, the penal system versus child welfare services, working collaboratively, coming to the table is going to be required. I think it was Mr. Mecca that said not one agency alone is the solution. But it is the role of the state legislature to set guidance and direction when it comes to the children of this state. And I believe the legislature has done so. It has opined on these issues. It has funded these programs. I know that there is additional funding uh, coming before the legislature this year to expand the funding for the CSEC programs. Um, there are 14 states in this country that have been able to figure this out to answer your question, Senator Hancock, about the New York scenario. I happen to believe that California, given our commitment to child victims, will be will join the ranks of those 14 states and figure out how we can manage um, providing the appropriate care and custody of this fragile at-risk population. With that, I ask for your aye vote of Senate Bill 1322. Thank you. Um, I will move the bill. There are just two of us here. <laughs> and um, please call the roll. Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Anderson, Glazer, Leno, Lou. Morning. Stone. No. Stone, no. Um, we will hold the roll open for the absent members. I and appreciate look that. look forward, hopefully, to working with you um, on this. And your last item is um, Thank you. item 34, SB 1433. <coughs> yes, ma'am. SB 1433 is a bill that will require state and local correctional facilities to provide family planning services for female inmates upon request. Although existing law allows female inmates to have access to continued use of birth control, meaning they were taking birth control before they were incarcerated in the facility, it does not specify that women who are not using birth control can request or can switch to a different contraceptive that suits her needs once incarcerated. SB 1433 acknowledges the fact that there are many medical uses for birth control besides preventing pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And I know this isn't health committee, but just to be on the record, mm -hmm. those include uh, regulating your menstrual cycle, treating the severity of cramps, hormonal imbalances, treatment of endometriosis, etc. Additionally, this bill requires that family planning services are offered between 180 to 60 days prior to an individual's parole release to ensure that they are informed and educated about the availability of planning, family planning services before they're released. It's important that the law be made clear that incarcerated females have access to birth control and adequate family planning services upon request and prior to their release date. With me today uh, are the consultants from the um, Women's Health for California Correctional Health Care Services, Wendy Steele, and Joyce Hayhoe, who's the Director of Legislation and Communications for CCHCS, to testify both in support of the bill and the fundamental need for the bill. I ask for your eye support. Thank you. This is in support. Joyce Hayhoe, Director of Legislation and Communications with the Receiver's Office. Um, it's been four decades since we've looked at the law regarding uh, female contraceptive and family planning services, and the need is to update it now to make sure that we provide the appropriate services at the appropriate time. Wendy still is here to talk about that in a little greater depth. Thank you, Madam Chair and esteemed member. Um, 
I am Wendy Still, and I am the special consultant for women's health care reform, uh, working for D Eureka, Dr. Eureka Day, who is the director of women's health, and on behalf of the receiver also. Uh, prior to this, I was the associate director of female programs uh, for the prison system and was responsible for the gender responsive effort for all of the reform to bring the services in parity with the male population as well as ensure that they were gender appropriate. This bill just takes that next step. The female reform master plan, which was uh, required by the legislature, um, identifies that health care is one of the gender responsive components. And as such, the um, having providing reproductive care consistent with community standards and also the Affordable Health Care Act um, and also Medi-Cal allowances uh, is what this bill will actually do. And it also is very consistent with the master plan and the original components that weren't really rolled out of the master plan was health care and mental health and the receiver's office has a whole women's health initiative designed to do this. And why it's important to have the legislation to do it is as of right now, even the legislation that exists allows women to continue whatever birth control that was they were basically taking prior to coming in. But there was a caveat in the actual language, too, that um, as uh, the physician would determine, right? And as of right now, the only women that are receiving continuing birth control are ones that basically, uh, because of medical necessities. So this makes it very clear. The receiver is completely supportive of it, and uh, it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Are there others in support of the bill? Uh, please come up and just state your name. And Natasha Minsker, ACLU of California, in support with great appreciation to the author for her leadership and to the receiver for their collaborative approach to this issue. Emilio Perez here with Planned Parenthood Affiliates of California in strong support. Thank you. Dennis Cuevas Romero on behalf of the California Attorneys for Criminal Justice in support. Khalif Asagai on behalf of the California Public Defenders Association also in support. Brittany Stone Cipher from Legal Services for Prisoners with Children in support. Thank you. Are there others in support? Are there speakers in opposition to the bill? Are there others in opposition? So if you can make them free with the table. I'd be happy to share my microphone with you. <laughs> Are you sure? Positive. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair. Corey Sauzillo here on behalf of the California State Sheriff's Association, regrettably in opposition to the bill. We're not opposed to uh, inmates who may become pregnant having birth control or access to other materials of that nature. Uh, we are concerned about the bill's sort of broad way of addressing this issue. Um, the way the bill is worded, it could bleed into traditionally male facilities given the fact that the language is written as such that an inmate who may become pregnant, so a transgender inmate who is housed in a male facility, would trigger this requirement. So the posting requirement, the availability of birth control and family planning, would trigger over into male facilities. We think that language could be tightened up. And I also think that the crossing of the bridge from a person who has birth control prescribed to them on their way into the facility, and then the notion of being able to choose a different method uh, or a different, a different type of medicine, for example, that I think we can probably get there mm -hmm. without the mm -hmm. way the bill is written right now. Um, uh, medical services are provided in jails. Um, I, I don't think the bill needs to be as broad as it is. So the way it's written now, we are in opposition given the unfunded mandates of the bill. Uh, the broad approach to any type of contraception um, and so we'll just leave it at that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Others in opposition? Seeing and hearing none. Um, questions and comments from members of the committee, or is there a motion? The motion would be do pass to appropriations. I think that might give time to, for the DAs to work with the receiver's office. And yeah, sheriff. Sheriff. Sorry about that. I've been called worse. <laughs> Um, and uh, see if they can reach any accommodations. It would be nice to have unanimous support. But would you like to close, Senator Mitchell? I, I would. I would just say that uh, that all of the uh, all of us who stood in support of AB 966, the Bone to Bill in 2014, that 
that made condoms available in CDCR facilities. I would hope that the same organizations who supported that conceptually would support this as well. Um, again, as we're talking about um, hormonal contraceptives, it's beyond family planning. Um, there are any variety um, of health issues that anyone who menstruates, uh, be transgendered, uh, in a male or female facility, anyone who menstruates may indeed require these uh, medications, and that's the goal of the receiver to provide them. And with that, I ask for your I vote. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Senator Glazer. Um, call the roll. Okay. Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Anderson? Glazer? Aye. Glazer, aye. Leno? Lou? Lou, aye. Morning? Stone? Okay, um, three to zero. We'll hold the roll open for the absent members. Thank you so much. Yeah. Senator Wolk, who's been in and out and very patient today. Welcome to the committee. She has SB 1006. Mm -hmm. SB 1206. 1006. Madam Chair, <laughs> Madam Chair, members, 1006 is a measure to establish a new firearm violence research center at the University of California. Research into gun-related injury, violence, or death was once the responsibility of the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and was funded by the federal government, along with research on many other public health issues. However, in 1996, at the request of the National Rifle Association, Congress passed something called the Dickey Amendment, authored by Representative Jay Dickey, a Republican from Arkansas. The amendment, combined with a reduction of funding to the CDC, stopped the gun violence research in its tracks, leaving policymakers with insufficient data and evidence to determine the most effective policies to reduce the number of deaths and injuries resulting from firearm violence, now over 33,000 annually in the U.S. and 3,000 in California. California is very well situated to fill this research gap. The University of California has the capacity to do what Congress has failed to do. Let's get the facts, apply sound scientific methods, and find answers that lead to solutions. Support for more firearm violence research is strong and includes, ironically, the author of the Dickey Amendment, Jay Dickey himself, who I believe has written a letter which you all should have. He's changed his mind. He's come out strongly in favor of more research, including this bill. And I will quote from him directly. Our nation does not have to choose between reducing gun violence injuries and safeguarding gun ownership. States can serve as a democracy's laboratories for firearm violence prevention research, as they do for other major health and social problems. This research could have been continued on gun violence without infringing on the rights of gun owners in the same fashion that the highway industry continued its research on deaths and injuries from head-on collisions without eliminating or outlawing the automobile. Congressman Dickey's point is a good one. The research that helped reduce deaths in automobile accidents is an important, that's an important point. Fifty years ago, the death rate from motor vehicles more than tripled the, de the death rate from firearms. But research and technology advanced seat belts mandatory, um, mandatory seatbelt laws, infant car seats, better bumpers and now airbags, better materials, better glass. Um, the motor vehicle death rate has dropped dramatically. We didn't outlaw cars. Better violence into firearm, better research into firearm violence, I believe, could yield similar reductions. This effort is co-sponsored by the California Ac uh, American College of Emergency Physicians, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. We have, strong, we have strong support from the public health community, law enforcement, and a growing list of bipartisan co-authors. Here to testify in support is Dr. Kevin Jones, an emergency physician at Sutter Medical Center, and Dr. Lindsay Harms, a pediatric resident representing the Academy of Pediatrics. And Garen Wintemute, Dr. Wintemute is here uh, from the UC Davis Medical School to answer any questions uh, that you may have. I ask for your I vote. Witnesses in support. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Kevin Jones. I'm an emergency physician uh, here at Sutter Medical Center in Sacramento, uh, speaking on behalf of the California chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians um, and representing uh, nearly 3,000 emergency physicians in California. Um, as physicians, you know, we uh, rely uh, heavily on, on research to provide uh, the most up-to-date and evidence-based care. Um, take, for example, stroke care. And over the last 20 years, the abundance of research uh, has led to uh, over 30% risk in mortality, uh, as well as uh, decreased uh, morbidity significantly, and a large part of that due to evidence looking at uh, prevention of stroke before they even get to uh, us in the emergency department. Um, and so, uh, you know, in contrast, uh, over that 20 years, the, the research looking at firearm violence has, um, uh, you know, has, has not been as abundant because of the lack of federal funding, and um, we've seen the effects of that. And so in the emergency department, we see the impact that firearm violence has um, and see the, you know, firsthand the physical and psychological trauma that it inflicts on its uh, victims, as well as the families uh, that uh, um, are affected by it um, and having to uh, console them due to a lost loved one or significant uh, injury. Um, and so, you know, just as, uh, um, you know, we see uh, the research looking at stroke care and other things that allow me to effectively treat my patients in the emergency department, feel that um, the research for firearm violence should also be um, extensive as well and feel that uh, California is in a position to do that uh, with this bill and would uh, ask for your support um, for this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair and committee members, I'm here on behalf of the AAP, which is co-sponsoring this bill and represents 5,000 physicians in the state of California, both subspecialists and general pediatricians. Like our colleagues in emergency medicine, uh, we're in support of SB 1006. And from personal experience, I know that gun violence is a pediatric issue, and this includes homicides, accidental shootings, and teen suicides as well. Gun violence is preventable, and yet it currently represents the second leading cause of death for American youth. And I wanted to talk just briefly about how pervasive the long-term consequences are that we see in clinic and in the hospital. So we know that under the age of 15 in the U.S., you're 10 times more likely to be accidentally killed by firearms than in other industrialized nations. But other consequences that I see are limb deformities from a young boy being accidentally shot by a friend through the leg, traumatic brain injuries in young children accidentally shot by themselves, uh, with a ho household gun. We know that the homicide firearm based homicide rate in youth in the U.S. is more than 35 times that in other high income nations. And I've seen how youth incorporate the statistic into their daily lives. I've met a young man who's been shot twice already, whose only plan for not being shot a third time is just not to go outside to go to school, and whose family history of gun violence is stronger than his history of heart disease. And we know that in the U.S., you are, if you're a teen, you're eight times more likely to commit suicide with firearms than other industrialized nations. We know this is the most common and the most lethal form of suicide for our teens. And in working with parents and siblings that have been torn by grief after the death of their daughters and their brothers, it brings into focus the need for research and data that moves us towards prevention, which is particularly important in our pediatric populations. So where many other fields in public health have made strides to decrease preventable death and injury rates, say for sleeping uh, with sudden infant death syndromes, rear-facing car seats for longer durations in our toddlers population, uh, water safety prevention for drownings, all through research, firearms violence prevention remains stagnant. And in a field with insufficient research, Prevention is a best guess effort where high morbidity and mortality rates are the cost of failure. So some opponents may feel that research is unnecessary, either because they anticipate a specific outcome or because they feel that enough research already exists, but I strongly disagree with this. The role of science is to guide us by objective data, especially where our personal bias might be misleading. If there's not enough objective data to clearly guide our preventative practices right now, Small, independent, grant-driven research sites lack the organization and context that a UC research center could provide, and California has the opportunity to take a leadership role in an area of national importance. As a pediatrician, I want answers for the families that I see. I want non-biased research. I want obje objective data to guide me on how best to protect the population of children I serve in the city, and I think that through SB 1006, California has the chance to be at the forefront of achieving this. I thank you for your time. Thank you. 
Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, John Lovell on behalf of the California College and University Police Chiefs Association. The testimony of the two prior witnesses is an eloquent exposition of the urgency of this for our organization. It is an unhappy reality that active shooter incidents take place disproportionately on college campuses. Last year, there was an active shooter incident on a college or university campus, this is across the country, once every eight days. Um, we urgently welcome this research strategy to guide us in strategies to reduce that carnage. Thank you. Are there others in support of the bill? Yes, uh, Nick Wilcox, on behalf of the 27 chapters of the Brady Campaign to Prevent Gun Violence and also on behalf of the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence in San Francisco in strong support of this bill. Thank you. Rebecca Gonzalez with the National Association of Social Workers California chapter in support. Lydia Bourne representing California School Nurses Organization in support. Khalid Fasagai on behalf of the California Public Defenders Association, also in support. Jennifer Tejada on behalf of California Police Chiefs Association. Sylvia Solis Shaw on behalf of Los Angeles City Attorney Mike Fuhrer in support. Thank you. Are there speakers in opposition to Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Timothy Wheeler. I'm a surgeon from Southern California, and I'm the director of Doctors for Responsible Gun Ownership. And I respectfully speak in opposition to Senate Bill 1006. Uh, we do not oppose research. Uh, we too, as Senator Wolk does, believe in facts and sound scientific principles. But we came here today um, to inform you that what is going on in gun research in the public health community uh, deals neither with facts nor with sound scientific principles. We're going to systematically build a case that owning firearms causes deaths. We're doing the most we can do given the political realities. That was Dr. P.W. O'Carroll, who was a top official at the Federal Center F Centers for Disease Control, and he was quoted in the February 1989 issue of the Journal of the American Medical Association. I've got another quotation from a prominent firearm researcher who is here with us today. Uh, he's located in Senator Wolk's district, and this quote's from the April 2001 UC Davis Medical School's newsletter, The Matrix. Quote, there was a huge, amply funded political organization that basically said, guns are a good thing, and we don't care how many people die. End of quote. That was the UC Davis's own Dr. Garen Wintemute, who is here with us today and I believe may speak. But he was insulting several million American citizens who are the members of the National Rifle Association and the 80 to 100 million Americans who are lawful gun owners. If I had 120 minutes to speak today instead of 120 seconds, I still wouldn't have enough time to tell you all the ways that Dr. Garen Wintemute has cleverly used the medical literature is requesting the UC Regents to set up a research center. It, we are not here to name names, cast aspersions on any researcher, and we're certainly not having a trial because then people are going to have to answer you, and we're not doing that in this committee. Well, so Madam, uh, Madam Chairman, if I there's a reason why you don't think we should request the UC Regents to set up a research center, 
forth. Any amendments you want to the to the bill, please make those. But no, no, we have 16 bills left to hear, and we're not going there right well, now. Then I will I'll Madam, statement. Madam Chair, may I may I defer to. Dr. Arthur Prisbrinda here, the social media director of Doctors for Responsible Gun Ownership, then. Madam Chairman, committee members, the fact is simple. Those who have published for decades, quote, unquote, gun violence research, have done so under a very thin veil of objectivity. It's been mostly advocacy research, and it's outrageous that Californian tax pay taxpayers, some of whom are gun owners, should subsidize a institute which will go to undermine their constitutional rights. And that is why this bill should not move forward. Thank you. Madam Chairman, members of the committee, Craig Deleuze with the Firearms Policy Coalition. Um, as has often been uh, alluded to in this committee is the Dickey Amendment. And uh, I will read it to you just one more time. It says, none of the funds made available in this title may be used in whole or in part to advocate or promote gun control. It, the whole point of the Dickey Amendment is simply to make sure that we are, in fact, getting objective information. There is nothing in the Dickey Amendment that prohibits research. What we're saying here is, is that if you look and just all you have to do is read the language of the bill, and it clearly sets up that this is about looking for research that supports gun control. Now, maybe it's just me, but deductive reasoning is I bring together all of the facts and then I come up with, with statements of fact, of what is, and utilize those to, in order to, to make decisions. Inductive reasoning is I've already made a decision as to what I want the outcome to be, and I'm going to look for information, research, or data that then supports that. This is an example of inductive reasoning, of reasoning that is about saying, we have an end that we want, and we just need the data to support it, because the data that currently exists doesn't support it. And as much as they want to say that, the data does, that, the, that, that there is no data, one of the supporters of their bill came up. He told you, once every eight days, there's an active shooter situation at a college campus. Where did he get that information, I wonder? It must have been from the data that doesn't exist. I, we're not against research. I don't think anyone here is saying that we're against research. But it ought to be objective. And you ought not state in the bill that you have an end game. And that is exactly what is stated. This is, this is a sole, basically a sole source contract for an individual who we know wants to ban guns by a legislator who we know wants to ban guns being presented to a committee that's already demonstrated or already passed at least today, gun bills that ban guns. All I'm saying is if you want us to believe that you are objective, then make sure that this measure, if it passes or if it doesn't pass, but if it does pass, goes forth and actually does have objective me measures in it. It uh, is for all of those reasons that we oppose this measure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there others in opposition to the bill? Okay, please do a me too. Madam Chair and members, Sam Paredes representing Gun Owners of California. Um, as we have pointed out in, in, in a similar bill in the State Assembly, we are strongly opposed to these predetermined... Well, when you have researchers that can... Okay, we're doing Me Too. Sorry, I apologize. I didn't hear you if you spoke that Thank and you. said that. So, my apologies. Me Too. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Edward of the National Rifle Association, we oppose the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Roy Griffith, on behalf of the California Rifle and Pistol Association, oppose the bill. Thank you. Are there others in opposition to the bill? Seeing and hearing none, are there questions or comments from members of the committee? Or um, Senator Stone? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, I certainly would like to see an objective study done, and I was just curious as to why this wasn't put out for like an RFP, RFQ, to find out if there's other UC institutions that uh, may be well suited to, to do an objective study. Um, you know, it's, it's suspicious, you know, this is your district, uh, UC Davis. Um, uh, th th there obviously has been some concerns about um, um, some of the uh, uh, professors at UC Davis's and their uh, their advocacy for uh, 
more gun control rather than um, uh, other other uh, second, Amai second Amendment right issues. So uh, can you explain your, your rationale and methodology and why, why we should use UC Davis? Why didn't we go out to an RFP or RFQ? And, and how do we tell uh, a UC, which is kind of autonomous from the state of California, what they're going to do and okay. how much money are we going to give them to do this if it's a, in addition to their existing budget? I agree with you about the process, which is why I didn't write the bill that way at all. The money is directed to UC, and they will, through a process, a competitive process, and whatever process they use internally, figure out where they're going to cite such an institute. I'd love for it to be at UC Davis, and I would have loved to have written the bill that way, but I did not, for precisely the reasons that you cite. Okay. We've asked the budget chair. Um, for an appropriation, so we'll go through that process. It would be $5 million for five years. And did you ask me something else? Um, I think you might have answered All right. the Thank questions. You, sir. Thanks for the question. I, I, it's important to make that very public. I appreciate that. Thank you. Senator Glazer. Uh, Madam Chair, I think this is a terrific bill, and if appropriate, I'd be happy to move it. Thank you. Um, the bill has been moved. Would you like to close? I would like to close, and very briefly, because I know you had a long have in front of you even longer. Uh, to the heart of this issue about what the center would be doing and whether the research is truly uh, independent or uh, objective or any of that, um, we actually took some suggestions from the NRA's letter about and incorporated some of their concerns. Uh, and for those of you that are interested on page three of the bill, the last uh, number two, it will tell you exactly what the center shall conduct. Uh, the type of research um, uh, with a mission to provide the scientific evidence on which sound firearm violence prevention policies and programs can be based. Its research shall, and this is the language from the NRA, shall include but not be limited to the effectiveness of existing laws policies intended to reduce firearm violence, that's our wording, their wording including the criminal misuse of firearms and efforts to promote the responsible ownership and use of firearms. I ask for your I vote. Please call the roll. Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Anderson? Glazer? Aye. Glazer, aye. Leno? Lou? Lou, aye. Morning. Aye. Morning, aye. Morning, aye. Stone. No. Stone, no. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. I have to go to the elections committee. Senator Bell. Number six. 